Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining the session. And also thank you to the WorkPath team for having us here today. Uh, we're going to um, introduce you to the renaissance of value-based management, training OKR uh, executive, training executives uh, on OKRs. So first of all, we uh, give a quick introduction about ourselves. Um, my colleague, Kerstin Meyer. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kerstin. I'm working in the uh, FS uh, industry now for roughly 25 years. First in the banking industry, later on for many, many years on the consulting side. And uh, together with Jeroen, we're running the German office uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, thank you, Kerstin. Yeah, I myself, I'm uh, since 2013 in consulting. Before that, I've been working for 15 years in the securities trading industry. So also all of my career in financial services. And that's also why uh, I joined Projective Group, which is an end-to-end -end partner for those who would like to excel in an ever-changing environment. Um, we offer niche expertise in the areas of uh, payments, data, risk and compliance, and of course, transformation, uh, doing quite a few agile projects with uh, some of our clients. Um, we have grown to a group of 650 consultants uh, in Europe, present in the main uh, financial services centers, and um, having uh, yeah, more than 140 active clients and uh, currently reaching around 100 million in revenues. So not a, really not a small player, but also not one of the big ones uh, and very still very adaptable to uh, the needs of our clients. However, it's really the people that we have in our teams that make the difference. Um, their passion, their deep domain expertise, uh, but also their hands-on um, approach is what provides uh, our clients as well as us the success that we, uh, that we would like to achieve. Then... Um, Today, of course, we'll, uh, that's not the, the topic of today. Today, we'd like to introduce you to uh, how to train executives in OKRs. Um, why do executives need a training? Um, there are a lot of challenges for executives. Uh, things have changed quite dramatically over the last 10 to 20 years. And that's why um, we would first like to give a view on why um, yeah, these challenges uh, exist. Um, the so-called VUCA challenges where VUCA means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And volatility means the, the velocity, the volume, and the magnitude of the changes that we currently see in the market and industries. Uh, this can be regulatory changes, um, changes in uh, supply chain, um, or even uh, a global pandemic. Things have become very um, unpredictable. Changes, big and small, uh, have significant impact on um, yeah, on the way companies need to um, need to react, and again, also this uncertainty is the unpredictability. Um, it's the ability uh, to um, anticipate change has uh, also is not also is also not the same as it used to be. Historical uh, experience or historical information or previous experiences can no longer be used to um, foresee what will happen in the future. Things are moving so quickly, uh, and things are moving in a completely different way than they used to be. Um, so companies need to be a lot more agile, uh, have to have different kind of strategies to be able to deal with these situations. Um, the next one is uh, complexity. Since uh, organizations have uh, grown worldwide, across countries, um, uh, have um, grown by... Uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, the overall environment in which they operate has become much more complex. And this makes it uh, even more challenging for uh, leaders to take the decisions and um, yeah, be, aware, be uh, conscious of what those decisions uh, may imply um, in all aspects of the organization. The last one is uh, ambiguity. And ambiguity means that the direction one would like to take um, is not clear. Um, the, 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 it's all new territory, and it's um, areas where uh, we have not um, yeah, be, been before. It's um, unfamiliar and out of the, uh, out of the comfort zone uh, for leaders. For example, no leader had the experience of 
how to deal with the pandemic and how to um, address the challenges that come uh, with, that, uh, with that pandemic. So all of these challenges have significant impacts and we have identified the, uh, the key ones for, uh, for the executives. Uh, the first one is that executives need to be um, an example. They need to play, um, uh, be a role model for the rest of the organization. And they need to combine substance with style and um, yeah, live um, the way uh, they would like the rest of the organization um, and behave the rest of the, like the rest of the organization uh, should do as well. And they need to do this in such a way that the people also believe what they, uh, what they say. The second one is um, creating a value-based culture meaning they need to establish and foster teams as well as individuals and to focus on uh, value and outcome for the organization and not just on finalizing output. The third one is um, a clear and transparent communication, continuously um, communicating on the um, company uh, values, company plans, on... Um, what it is that the company would like to achieve is very important to make sure that everybody is aligned and everybody is working towards the same goal. Um, doing this also via a dedicated channel that allows for feedback and questions um, makes it possible uh, for the whole organization um, to follow up on this and to um, also bring their input into that uh, overall process. Then the fourth one is strategy and execution. Um, enabling employees, and not only enabling, but also empowering them to bring in innovative ideas and foster the alignment between teams, uh, also across the organization, across divisions. Um, so things are no longer working in silos, but across the organization. And also to initiate commitment among all of them uh, to execute and understand the company strategy. And again, to, uh, to um, uh, support this, the visualization of that is key. And also here, the um, uh, res reporting on the metrics of the key results uh, helps in creating this understanding within the organization to see how far we have gotten to achieve these goals and what ways we still have to go. Uh, the last one, the state of flux. Again, that's the, the, the uncertainty. So... Um, the expectations within the environment, within society, have changed also quite dramatically over the last, um, last few years. Keeping up with those expectations is very relevant for a company to make sure that they continue to follow uh, the market. And um, yeah, the, 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 whether you define society as being your clients, your uh, regulator, um, different parties can have different expectations, but you all need to take this, those into account and adapt to those accordingly. Then looking at how we deal with um, these um, risks or how we identify the risks um, and what are the risks if these not, are not being addressed, we use the so-called FEX uh, methodology. FACTS stands for focus, alignment, commitment, tracking, and stretching. And we add another one, and that is the uh, top-down uh, and bottom-up uh, approach that is required for, um, for OKRs as well. Uh, so the first one, focus. Focus is the ability to home in on what is uh, most important uh, for the organization, on what matters most. And as uh, John uh, Durr said in Measure What Matters, an effective goal-setting system starts with disciplined thinking at the top, with leaders who um, invest time and energy um, to, um, to choose what counts. And that's really uh, important because if leadership really focuses, this focus will trickle down throughout the organization and help um, all other contributors uh, to get uh, rid of the anxiety that they may have uh, that they are not may not be working on the right stuff. Then um, alignment. 
alignment is um, effectively collaborating between the teams in an organization. And they all need to be involved. Um, it is also the ability to act um, in concert with these, uh, with these goals. Um, and what it does, it paves the way for um, uh, collective success in determining also the next best steps. Um, and it helps in making sure that everybody knows uh, exactly what they have to do to achieve the goal. Then um, commitment. In the context of uh, OKRs, commitment is the, um, the shareholders' participation and buy-in um, that, um, that's needed to achieve those big goals. In general, people are reluctant to commit unless they know what they are committing to. And gaining their commitment requires a conscious effort by leadership and the structure for sharing those um, organizations' vision and strategy. And again, that's where OKRs come in because they provide that structure. They make uh, it plain what's important and why. Then the fourth one is, um, is tracking. Um, tracking is very important as that provides a view on how we are doing uh, on our uh, objectives on our achieving our goals. It will give us an indication of where we are at and what we still need to do. Um, it also um, can provide us uh, further uh, details on how, what we uh, need to, uh, to sustain our success or what we need to do to close our gaps. Then the fifth one, the, the text is a little bit missing at the bottom, but that's uh, stretching. Um, of course, OKRs give, give us a superpower of, uh, of stretch, and that helps us, um, or that, that makes the teams uh, go new directions. They need to think out of the box, and uh, that helps organizations to um, grow exponentially. They um, um, help in... Um, yeah, um, achieving goals that normally would not have been achieved um, as the, um, yeah, we now expect teams and also reward teams for uh, going the extra mile and thinking uh, in a different way. Then lastly, um, but definitely not uh, last but not least, is that um, if the um, goal setting remains a top-down environment, we will not have the success that we need. We need to empower the teams um, to also bring in their ideas. And they need to be able to set their own objectives, of course, aligned with top line objectives. Um, but that helps them in um, yeah, becoming empowered and feeling that they are part of the game and that they can influence the, um, the whole goal setting process. And they also understand and feel that what they are doing within the team is contributing to the overall strategy. Um, from this point on, I would like to hand over to, uh, to Kerstin. He will be um, running through, um, or he will be untying the knot that we just uh, tied on the, on the previous uh, slide, and will uh, provide a little bit more detail on the approach that we take uh, in our day-to-day -day business with clients um, on the, and the training on the of, uh, executives. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thanks for giving us insights to the risk and challenges because they are really key to understand, to move forward, to get the how. The how is we think, and it's actually stated as what, but it is a how. We see a mitigation strategy really important to overcome these burdens, to overcome the situation of the challenges. And therefore, it's key to have some values guiding you through the whole journey. We have identified four different values. For us, they are important. They ha you have to live up to for them as an executive. First of all, we're talking about adaption. Adaption is for us the living and breathing of something new, of something new methodology, where you feel that you're part of something new. And we have the problem that most executives nowadays are just leaning back and are not really interesting and not buying into the story and just watching the show, which often leads to failure. Secondly, we have responsibility. And responsibility is uh, 
understanding the mission, the goals. That sounds weird. Um, uh, understanding the mission and goals, because when you know them by heart, you can be a responsible leader for the company. Next of it's transparency. And transparency for us is be open in, to, in terms of communication. Communication often, effectively. And that's key, because if you are really an open speaker to, the, to your uh, people, it builds trust. And finally, commitment. You have to see the long-term goal of something, and not only the short-term. Because if you have the long-term goal, it leads to something very fruitful and something that will sustain over time. So how do we do that? And uh, sadly, the presentation slowly moves down. Um, there should be adoption and all the other values underneath. Uh, but it actually tells you a story. So we would like, or we see, uh, to build this new value-based culture that you build kind of new role models. And you re the, the executive have to act as a role model for the organization. And it starts, and uh, the color coding should be also, so that's more on the adapting side. Um, so the, they should be coached, the executives. They have to be trained. They have to really understand the whole setup of a new methodology, of a framework like the OKR framework. Secondly, they have to bridge to other executives because they can't work in silos. They have to understand and have a common approach. And that's really key. Taking sponsorship, very, very important from our perspective, because it's really great to learn and to get the experience, but you really learn by practicing it in real life. So funding a key initiative, a Lighthouse project, will give you also the credibility internally to be successful. Next one, again, is regarding living and breathing. I already mentioned that, but that's really key to have this long-term goal in mind, to move forward, understanding what you're doing there. And last but not least, becoming an advocate, somebody who's really seen in our organization as somebody who is standing for this topic. And that's, I think, what we're all aiming for. And as I said, this role model helps an organization to really drive this forward. And when executives buying in into such a new framework, the success rate is much higher. Now it's really getting really hot. <laughs> um, the lean approach. Um, you can already see up, up from the last page uh, the color coding. But anyway, um, uh, we see very often that today's um, executives has, have the issue that they are far too complex and we need a more simplistic way of working. And it starts with keep it simple, keeping it short. And when we say that, we think about that executives should act more in an ease way, should highlight their mission, their goals in a way that people understand what actually they want to achieve. Because nowadays, when you see many, many of the executives, they have so complex thoughts, ideas, um, directions, that in the end, it leads to misunderstanding, irritation in the organization, and often leads to failure on projects. Seek to improve, also very important if you move forward, because we have a framework, the OKR framework, but of course it will evolve over time within the organization. It probably will be tailored to the needs, and therefore it's a never-ending story of learning. And that's really key to understand, that it's not just learning in the first instance and then everything is fine. No, you have to keep on looking for the improvement. Focus on outcome. I think we have discussed this today quite often, and Johannes gives quite a good insight to that, but it's really key to also focus on that. Trust in people. You have to empower the people. I think OKR shows you quite intensively how it's important to empower people and to actually see them be successful, because then the success comes back to the executives, and they are successful as well. Underneath, you will uh, don't see that here, but uh, it's actually highlighting again the communication. Communication for us is really required as often as possible. Many, many organizations fail in communicating well with their people, and that leads often to mistrust. So communicating often in an effective way helps to build this trust that helps you to be uh, effective and uh, better in sustaining that. Um, it's even getting worse. So I'm jumping now between two pages. Um, 
So we see, uh, as we all know, that the OKR framework uh, for CSETs, 60% comes actually from the people, from the teams, the strategy, the thoughts, the direction. Uh, we, they can't be taken out of the equation. So we see that, that we have a top-down executive-driven approach. We have a bottom-up team-driven approach guided through with the OKR framework. And it will guide through a kind of understanding phase, a learning phase, and finally the practice. And during this whole process, it will evolve and integrate to something where both ends will understand what the other side actually wants and be more effective. And in the end, have more clarity on more outcome focus than, than before. Um, I jump now, still the same page, but I have to jump. You see also some objectives that are important for the executives. And it is very important that in the beginning, executives are open, curious about something new, that they're committed to this new story. If they are not, probably will fail. Secondly, they should give guidance in the next phase, guidance to the teams, challenge other stakeholders, because very often they are not challenging them. They try, try, don't try to build a common ground between other executives. And, of course, support the organization on their way forward. And lastly, they have to act, to act like a role model. They have to communicate very often, very strong, and live the new values and the framework day by day. So uh, I don't have to jump further because it's still more or less the next page. Um, so how do we see that? How the transition will happen? And usually, um, it shows actually here as a sequence. It's more something that happens parallel. But we still think it's good to highlight what happens mainly in these months. So for the first two months, it's more about the coaching, helping them to become successful, helping the executives to understand the framework, and then start to integrate, first of all, vertical, and then horizontal, to have both equations, both sides together and learning together. This builds this kind of foundation to then start to build a kind of expertise in, internally and start a first um, lighthouse pilot project because it's re really important. Would be nice. Thank you so much. You make my day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, because it's really important to have this lighthouse pilot project to really gain the benefits, to highlight to the company what this means in practice, and also take the lessons learned from it back into the, uh, into the teams, into the learning. And then define tailored best practices, because not all the best practices that are out there are suitable for your company. So it's really important to tailor them to the needs. And then start to realize the benefits. It's about doing good and talk about it. Because as soon as people understand that there is success within the new methodology, suddenly the scaling is much, much easier. And that we should all, all aim for. There are, of course, some success criteria uh, to them uh, next to it. Um, commitment, we have already highlighted that a couple of times, but I think it's still key to mention that again because it's a different commitment. It's a commitment of the overall organization, of all ex executives, all team members to this new methodology. And that's key. Next of it, it's time. Executives need to have time to learn, to be coached, and also take then a leading position to teach the people internally and to give guidance to the people. Next of it, budget. Of course, they need is budget required for the overall journey. It's, you probably need a coach coming in from the outside, helping the organization to evolve in that direction. Plus, you need budget for a first pilot project or a lighthouse project, which highlights the benefits. And it's important to also gain the benefits early because it much, makes much life much, much easier. You need freedom. Um, I know that there are various methodologies out there, but if you don't start on a greenfield approach, it will probably also lead to failure because it easily interferes with your day-to-day -day work on the project if you don't have the freedom that you need for a new methodology. And lastly, understanding. It's key that people who are involved understand and are able to take over a role model 
function and understanding what is all about the new methodology. And that's key from our perspective. So um, now we have talked a lot about uh, the theory. How did we do that? So um, we're currently supporting um, a key financial uh, markets player on their journey towards OKRs. And on that journey, we are not only being asked to uh, be the company who supports them during the integration, implementation of OKRs, but also during the coaching of the executive board. And we have uh, the CEO, or together with the CEO, defined, we defined um, OKRs that have been aligned also with the supervisory board. So the supervisory board understands from the first instance what kind of strategic roadmap, strategic goals there are. At the same time, the CEO understands in a very, very good manner what kind of strategic direction the company has to go. And also with the teams, they understand where are the challenges, where are the burdens. So the CEO can now support the teams to foster collaboration and to be more proactive and maybe leverage synergies for weak areas. And that's a very, very strong way forward. Furthermore, the CEO also understands the value creation and the outcome that will finally result from that. And that is, as I said in the beginning, it's already aligned with the supervisory board, so it's placed back. So there's a good understanding end-to-end -end for the overall organization, where to go, which direction the people have to go, and uh, how to align each other, and to have a one common goal for, the, for this company. We're currently at the end of phase one, so we have uh, had a pilot, pro, uh, pilot project. We had uh, a pilot started, and we're now in the middle of uh, uh, the discussion for the scaling because it was such a success. Um, the company is very willing to go the next step with us, uh, scaling it and making it more successful in the future. So um, thank you very much. Happy to take your questions, if there are any. <laughs> um, but feel free. Thank you. Yes, please. What's your impact, like, uh, living in a new team, um, OKR organization, so it's most important, most important. Could you share, like, the most effective best practice when it comes to that? Like, what would that be? <laughs> so I have to repeat your question, otherwise uh, the audience won't understand it. So what is the effective way when it comes to living and breathing, uh, if I could get you correctly, yeah. uh, the OKRs, the best practices? So what we have done is have these kind of joint sessions between uh, different kind of um, executives where we really challenged them and they challenged each other. So they had in the beginning, some of them a different understanding of what actually they should aim for. And we helped them to have this kind of common, finding a common ground. And it was not an easy way forward because they had quite a lot of struggles and misinterpretations and stuff like that. But it worked out quite, quite in a positive manner that they found a common ground. And you can easily imagine suddenly that they, it's a kind of living and breathing. So when they talk about something, everybody understands it around the executives. At the same time, it also played back to the teams. So also they understand now how this whole setup should work. Does it answer your question? Wonderful, thank you. Any other question? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Uh, you showed this example with the last page. Um, what I would be interested in here um, did you draft the OKRs with the, the, the executives at the C level on a first year, uh, first month basis or also on a quarterly basis? We started with a quarterly basis. No, no, uh, as a kind of uh, pilot to really get into the mode of slowly adapting to the kind of new way of working. So it's, um, but we are now uh, moving towards rather longer term goals. Yes, please. Go ahead. You know, I'm, sorry, 
I just have one eye. I'm just looking with this one. I can't help it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so we, we started with un, one area because it was uh, for a pilot very easy to, to start there. We're scaling now in a whole department now, in the whole area of, the, of the, this customer. Because it's now easier to give this kind of the, the successes that we have achieved there, to scale that now on, on that level. And later on, we want to scale it for the whole world company. Yes, please. Um, Pilot project, but it's okay until you get this pilot project really working and can show it to an organization. It can take uh, not 12 months as a minimum to say, okay, here, you can see it's really working and we, we get some benefits uh, out of this. So we were thinking if it's not better to, let's say, roll out a complete, uh, complete entire organization. Yeah, I think there, there's both uh, side of a medal. Um, from my perspective, um, it's better to start with a pilot because you can learn from it. You can tailor it to your needs. Because if you do a big bang, it might not 100% fit to the overall organization. You, you're not able to coach all the people in the organization. And for me, that's um, quite an intense workload to start with something like that. Rather starting with a pilot, and showing the benefits early. So don't have the major, very long uh, project used for that, rather something smaller, and also playing back first results. That's also something you can easily do. And I think I would rather use that approach, but of course, there are other companies who would love to have a big bang, but <laughs> I think there's no right or wrong. Yes. Yes, please. The lady was first. You already... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we actually have a different approach. We have um, now worked, we aligned the pilot project, and it did not work out well. So I would like to challenge that and give an opinion. And um, I was actually wondering, um, we were talking at one point about specificity and keeping the communication short, easy, and often. What channels do you uh, recommend for the for the um, we used several uh, ways of uh, communicating. So we used, for example, we had a town hall where the executive really uh, stood up and uh, talked to the people in a very, on a very common ground. So it was not something on the podium. It was rather sitting together, which is not so easy if you're a large organization. Um, also, um, having kind of uh, updates, regular updates, um, using um, also being active on uh, platforms where you can then rather have short chats, something like, uh, uh, I saw that at least uh, that organization with teams with other uh, methods where they really had this interaction and try to be close in terms of communication. And what is the definition? <laughs> it also depends there um, uh, to the needs of the organization. There's no, also no right answer for it. Um, from our perspective, it's important to do it as often as needed for the people to be happy. And that's not a good answer, but uh, it, it, it varies from company to company. Um, I think he was the first, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think the good thing is if you get the chance to have this kind, sorry, oh, sorry. Um, so the question was, um, how to not interact with other methodologies and how to keep this new OKR framework alive and not interfering. Is that correct? Or stopping others. Yeah. Um, not an easy question, to be honest. Um, 
I think it's it's key that, uh, as I said in the beginning, um, you need a greenfield approach. If you highlight on the greenfield approach that your way is more successful than others, you have an easier way of uh, discussing this topic with uh, other people. Of course, um, and I'm, I'm quite honest, I, I don't have been there yet. So there are still other uh, methodologies around. So um, I have to be clear, uh, I don't have the correct answer for that, but I think the uh, a greenfield approach could be quite helpful for that. And there was a question, yes. The CEOs or the C level in terms of mindset, where you say, okay, we're not going to start this process because they're not open to this. They might think it's nice and fashionable, and I, I think we should do it, but then hmm, how do you convince them? Because I'm thinking of the one to one coaching being more convincing than coaching, probably. Um, so I have to repeat the question. Um, so how um, we do the screening in terms of finding the right uh, people or the right stakeholders to be on our road and how to... Um, the good thing was at our end that uh, we had the buy-in from the first day from the CEO, from the board. And therefore, we didn't have too much um, interference. We, of course, had a few um, people who probably weren't that open. But as we, as I told you, with this kind of executive sessions where they discussed together, they suddenly some of them started to think differently, started to be more open by seeing that other people have more understanding, better insights. And that at least helped a lot on our journey. But there, of course, are people out there who probably, and maybe you want to say something, but... No, I don't think we have a specific uh, screening process uh, in place to uh, check if indeed the, um, the, the leadership is up uh, to uh, implement the OKRs. Uh, but it's definitely something that um, probably is a very valid point uh, to also make sure that the, the success that also we would like to achieve with the clients um, is indeed achievable. Uh, because if if we we what we said as well, commitment is very key in this uh, in this topic. And if you don't have the full commitment from the leadership on the implementation of the OKRs, then of course, um, yeah, there is already a big part missing, and you may uh, indeed not be successful. So this screening process uh, is something to uh, to think about. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I just see the watch. Uh, do we still have a, a time for a question, or shall we stop? Okay, wonderful. Any other question, please? Yeah. Are there any uh, ways to, because the transparency doesn't build not only trust, but sometimes anxiety uh, regarding some sensitive OPRs or some projected use that we have, so would you recommend to do that? Um. I also have to answer here to, to a certain extent. Um, so the question was regarding um, how the uh, CEO uh, OKRs are um, revealed to the overall organization and whether they should or whether they shouldn't and how to cope with them. Um, at least the ones we had so far or the, the ones we discussed with uh, as a CEO were that we thought or the organization thought it's it's really important to show the direction um, to the overall staff to the people because then they know what they're buying in uh, by uh, paying into so every effort from each of the teams the direction the values and all the topics are then moving into what's into this direction of the uh, uh, the ceo um, i could imagine that there are some uh targets that probably shouldn't be uh revealed but um not there yet, sorry. I think maybe one comment from, uh, from my side. 
indeed the organizational uh, OKR should of, sure, of course be uh, presented and be made transparent to the whole organization. If it's more about personal targets or personal objectives of the um, senior stakeholders, um, that's uh, a more delicate uh, topic and I think these should not be uh, made fully transparent. Same goes for certain strategic uh, objectives that a company has. Also, this is not uh, being made uh, public to the rest of the organization. Certain things need to be kept aside, but if it's about the organizational um, objectives, of course, those need to be uh, transparent, need to be clear, also for the rest of the organization, so also the other teams can align with those objectives, because that is, in the end, the overall goal that, uh, or the overall outcome that the organization would like to achieve. Last question, okay. Yes, please. No, we don't. <laughs> Are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking this because um, one of the main problems was uh, one of the time that they had a security on an executive level and kind of combination to um, the payroll. Yeah. That's part of the payroll. Oh, and they said they don't support the OKR as long as they are in a kind of completely way. And they don't support the introduction as a payroll or something like this. It's, it's something that I would love to take with me and uh, maybe discuss it uh, with also my peers. And happy to come back to your question. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and hopefully it was useful, fruitful for you. Thank you so much.